This video is brought to you by Opera GX Browser, a browser made specifically for gamers with really handy features like being able to pop out YouTube videos so you can watch them on top of whatever game you're playing. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more or click the link in the description below to download for free. This is the perfect moment that summarizes how I feel about Marvel's Avengers. I'm fighting as Captain America, beating on some random goon, and I'm about to set up for a sweet air juggle combo when all of a sudden I hear the thrum of Thor's hammer in my left ear as it sails toward me. I see it collect this goon as I'm air juggling him, and then Cap bugs out in an animation glitch. Okay, but don't focus on the glitch yet. Focus on the fact that I'm fighting as Cap alongside Thor, and it's so authentic an experience that this goon is pinned to the rock face, held there by Molnir until Thor recalls it. That's awesome. That feeling that you wanted when you slapped $60 down to get this game, that feeling of being part of this team and just doing Avengers things with your Avenger buddies, this game does deliver that. But then there's this, which believe you me, is just the tip in what is an absolute mountain of shit that will utterly ruin this video game for you. If you have clicked on this video hoping for a merciless flaying of Marvel's Avengers, you're gonna be disappointed. For the many, many, many things that Marvel's Avengers gets wrong, the game nails the hardest and most important objective that it sets for itself. It's fun to play. Even with all the bullshit packed into this game and all the things it gets fatally wrong, it's undeniably fun. And each character only becomes more fun and more rewarding as you continue to unlock their kit and deepen your mastery of them. Similarly, if you clicked on this video hoping for some sort of I was wrong about the Avengers walk back, then you, my friend, need to go back to the subreddit because you're certainly not going to find that here. This game is an absolute mess on multiple levels. Level design, objective design, enemy design and variety, the atrocious camera, the phoned in boss fight, the shameless copying of Destiny's formula without adding nearly enough new stuff to make it palatable, the absolute worst loot system I've ever experienced in a looter, the greediest cash shot we've seen in a premium AAA game this year, and the most buggy AAA game I've played at launch. At least I could play Fallout 76. I'm at a point in the Avengers Endgame now where a mix of bugs and design choices mean I can't even play the game. Marvel's Avengers is important to take a good look at because it serves as a sort of checkpoint in this whole games as a service journey that this industry has been going on this generation. We can look at its successes and failures and ask, what has this industry learned about launching this type of game? The answer is some things, but nowhere near enough. I'm going to say a lot of good things about this video game in this review. I'll tell you right now, I like where this is going. I actually think it has a bright future, but there's no way in hell it should have been released in this state. Frankly, it's shameful, and Marvel's Avengers is going to need a good 12 to 18 months before the game is even close to fully finished. Like Destiny, The Division, Fallout 76, Ghost Recon, Breakpoint, and Anthem, Marvel's Avengers serves as a reminder that when it comes to live service, it's typically best to sit out at least the first year. Given the IP, given Crystal Dynamics' track record, and given how long this had been in development, I had hoped that things would have turned out very differently. The final release of Marvel's Avengers starts the story slightly earlier than we experienced when we played the beta. In the prologue, we're introduced to Kamala Khan, a teenager who's entered a fan fiction competition to be judged by the Avengers themselves. She's a finalist and she's on her way to A Day, a weird sort of Avengers merchandise festival where the team not only announce the winner of the fan fiction contest, but they also unveil a newly discovered energy source to power their brand new heli carrier, because those two announcements definitely go hand in hand. In my beta impressions, I commented that Marvel's Avengers didn't grab me in the way that I had hoped, and that I wasn't a huge fan of Kamala Khan being a star of the show. I'm pleased to tell you that I don't think those things anymore, and that with the benefit of the prologue and more time with these characters, the whole package won me over. The conversion began here, in this moment. What is your name? Oh, Kamala Khan. Uh-huh. And what is that thing you are holding? Oh, it's a high-density muon beam. A Model 3 Repulsor Club. It's Tony Stark's first love. Odin's beard. About as intimidating as the man himself, 
Oh, you're funny. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Something about this interaction made me smile. Kamala's enthusiasm felt grating at first, like it was laid on too thick. But in this moment, I experienced that excitement that she felt. Like, oh, imagine if you just bumped into Thor. How cool would that be? I'd probably be giggling like a schoolgirl as well. I got the same vibes when Kamala met Cap. You know, for what it's worth, I thought that was pretty brave. Uh, thanks. I'm guessing you're a Captain Marvel fan. She's <laughs> off planet, but she would have liked to meet you. I'm sorry. You're Captain America. What this prologue does so successfully is instill in you the same sort of giddy excitement that Kamala carries with her throughout her journey. That's not to say, though, that all of it's perfect. You're in the way. I'm, I'm sorry. This contest should only be for the real fans. <laughs> and the mob. And the press. And the whole world tell you to move. You plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth. And you say no. You move. What? Never said that. A real fan would. Kamala's character walks a fine line. At any point, it's the sort of steely-eyed determination that heroes are made of. At other points, it's the sort of cringe energy that those Batman cosplayers emit. What gives you the right? What's the difference between you and me? I'm not wearing hockey pants. Some will find Kamala a little too much for their taste, but I think most people will appreciate how much heart she brings, especially among the cast of characters that are fairly flat and lifeless. Bruce Banner is a broken man, his nerves shattered by the A-Day incident. The majority of his dialogue sounds like he's ordering McDonald's, but can't quite make up his mind what he wants. Sorry. Talking about. Tony Stark is just a pain in the ass. This guy will not shut up during combat, and his lines are never not annoying. Heart attack! Gotta get something off my chest! This one's from the heart! Don't look directly at the beef, kid! Black Widow and Captain America both have the same problem of just being there. Neither of them have a personality or anything interesting to say, they just exist as playable entities. The MCU showed us a vision of these characters that had a lot more heft in them than what we see here, so this isn't a case of that's just how the characters are. And Thor, like, man, he's such a missed opportunity. If Black Widow and Cap are just there, then Thor just isn't. For a character so bursting with personality, he feels criminally underutilized throughout it all. The writing team attempt to use tension as a substitute for personality. Much like the first Avengers movie, this is a tale about a team coming together, where on the silver screen, it was the formation of the new team. Here, it's about the reassembling of the team after the tragic events of A-Day and navigating the character conflicts that still bubble under the surface. It works, but it's certainly predictable. On at least two, maybe three occasions, some tension would erupt in a scene only to be reconciled that very same scene. Maybe that's why Monica got the better of you. Look, I'm uh, not very good at. I'm sorry. So, say. Good enough. It just flares up momentarily and then it vanishes like a fart in the wind. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I mean, it's just good old comic book drama, but don't go into Marvel's Avengers expecting to see anything you haven't seen before. This sort of goes for the main storyline and the scarce number of villains that form its backbone. There's AIM, which has sprung up to protect humanity from, you know, bad things, and they sick their army of robots on the Inhumans, people who gain superpowers on A-Day. It's pretty cool, some nice villain banter at times, but yeah, it's not exactly the Dark Knight or the Winter Soldier or hell, it's not even Spider-Man 3, but it'll do as a foundation for punching some bad guys for a few hours, so what the hey. The fairly mundane take on the Avengers personalities and the very stock standard villain plot makes Kamala the linchpin that holds all of this together. Every scene she's wearing her heart on her sleeve, believing when others doubt, calling for action when the rest of the team would do nothing. She's defiant to a fault, resolute, incorruptible, and the deep well of her faith in others knows no bottom. You feel invested in her personal journey in a way that you see simply don't with the other Avengers. It's a shame then that one of the more profound aspects of her journey, the way she becomes an Avenger, is so glossed over. 
There's really no scene that recognizes the moment when she officially joins the team. It just kind of happens by a process of osmosis. The nearest thing is halfway through the campaign when a faction NPC says this. Glad an Avenger's on the case. This was the first time that Kamala was called an Avenger during my playthrough. It wasn't in a carefully crafted scene where the mantle was bestowed on her, where Kamala can have that moment of realization that she's joined the ranks of the heroes she's worshipped her whole life. No, it happens at some random faction NPC who hands out mindless bounties and spouts out some generic line of dialogue that could have been delivered to anyone. It's just one of many examples of how the live service multi player side of this game crudely crashes into the more curated campaign, leaving it worse for wear at every collision. Martin Scorsese famously took a swipe at Marvel films, saying they weren't really cinema. He says they're more like amusement park rides, where you go for cheap, predictable thrills, not to learn something new or be challenged. Now, I don't agree with the idea that the value of the MCU should be waved away like that, but I do agree with the idea that these movies are essentially amusement park rides, where you hop on the roller coaster and it does the build up thing, and then the downhill thing, and then the loop the loop thing, and some other stuff, and then it's over. The core of them is excitement, just like Marvel Comics were, just like this video game is. Marvel's Avengers campaign is actually two games in one. One game is a thrilling roller coaster, on rails, carefully planned out, designed to maximize your thrills. Its moments of buildup exist to make the downhill rush all the sweeter. It's fast and frenetic, and at times it's fantastic. The other game is the live service multiplayer rubbish that has been crudely smooshed into this otherwise enjoyable campaign experience to prolong it and to ease players into the end game grind. If the single player missions are a roller coaster, then the multiplayer stuff is dodge'em cars, going absolutely nowhere, constantly stopping and starting, and endlessly bumping into bullshit. Marvel's Avengers campaign will take about 10 hours to clock, and about five of those hours are great. They're scripted linear missions that take you into new settings you've not seen before, many of which you will only see during the campaign, and you better savor them, because as of right now, there is no way to replay these campaign missions once you've completed them. None. One mission is particularly excellent. It's Tony Stark running through his old family estate, cobbling together a suit from leftover pieces he can scrounge together. You put it together piece by piece as you move through, and your abilities unlock with each new piece found. It's genuinely great stuff. In another, your base of operations is suddenly attacked, and you're moving through its gizzards, trying to fight off foes as you do so. This is another great mission full of scripted drama that is exactly what we were all hoping for when we saw this game announced. There's a handful of these cinematic missions, but not too many. They're very Uncharted-esque, pushing forward with style through exciting set pieces in a delicate balance of guided gameplay, narrative exposition, and technical wizardry. When you're in them, you're getting a taste of what might have been if the developers had focused exclusively on this sort of content, if they'd chosen to make one game. They didn't, of course, and as a result, many sacrifices had to be made. One of the biggest sacrifices was villains and boss battles. There are only three villains that you fight against here, and only two of them have the sort of exciting multi-stage fights that you've come to expect from games like Spider-Man or Batman. The Abomination is just a big meat sack who you punch for a while and then it's over. There's thousands of villains in the Marvel Universe, and we get three. The rest are just big, lifeless robots. Just robots, robots, robots. Like, uh, there was one encounter where you have to fight this robot that's basically like a cabal mining machine from Destiny. And then when you kill it, another one spawns straight away. And then the mission ends. It's like the perfect showcase for how little variety there is here. The major sacrifice the campaign makes though is overall mission quality, since it introduces you to the multiplayer missions early on and weaves them into the campaign at various points. These are missions in big, empty spaces leading into repetitive, narrow interiors where the objective is always something completely impersonal and meaningless, like hacking a computer for some innocuous information, or destroying a generator, or standing on a thing for a while. It's not just objectives for these missions that are lackluster though, it's really the fundamental DNA of each of these levels. They look so bland and empty, just wide open space that's pockmarked by random structures and out of place floating platforms. It reminded me of Zen from Half-Life, like the original 
zen, not even the Black Mesa one. Weird and nonsensical level design that completely forsakes aesthetic and immersion for expedience and functionality. These missions also feel so staccato, so regularly interrupted. You're cruising towards your objective when you see a random crate of resources out of the corner of your eye, so you hang a sharp left to run over to it and punch it and stand there for a moment to ensure all the resources get hoovered up and then you press on. You'll see some chest hidden behind some wall and you search for annoying switches for like two minutes to try and get this thing open. Sometimes you can't even open the door if you're playing as Captain America because for some reason he can't hack terminals and he can't punch through heavy doors when all the other characters can do that. So if you're playing as Cap like I was, bad luck, that chest is not available to you. Who thought that was a good idea? You'll often be notified of resource caches off in the distance and since the economy is tuned so tightly and you need every resource you can get, you feel obliged to take a detour and collect a huge portion of these multiplayer missions are just doing boring bullshit to feed the end game resource economy. It's not fun to punch boxes and collect floating orbs, and yet this game will ask you to do that hour after hour. In a way, I'm harsher on these multiplayer missions than I otherwise might be because of how poorly they compare to the curated single player missions. When you go from an exciting sequence running through an exploding space station, it's demoralizing to get dropped onto a location you've been to eight times before to do something you've done 12 times before. It makes it feel as though the game isn't respecting your time, which ultimately it isn't. I think it's a rather stinging indictment on the quality of looter shooter campaigns that despite all of the issues with this one, it's still among the better campaigns that this genre has served up. It has the best story and characterization we've ever seen from a looter campaign. And I think that when its missions are real proper single player missions, they're solid. And I know that for many, that'll be enough to justify some sort of price tag. Perhaps not $60, but maybe $30 or less. Many of you will be asking, should I play this game for the campaign alone? And I'm like, eh, sure, go for it. When it's on sale and they fix all the bugs, give it a crack. You'll probably enjoy yourself. And who knows, by the time you eventually pick it up, they might have fleshed out some of their end game issues because right now there really isn't an end game at all. We all like to joke about how influential Destiny has been on looter games from The Division to Anthem to Outriders. Marvel's Avengers offers up the most shameless recreation of the Destiny formula to date. It's crazy. I couldn't believe it when I was seeing it in action. I mean, obviously it starts with the cursor based UI and the general UI layout, which, you know, it's Destiny, but whatever, no big deal. Then there's the faction vendors, which appear during the campaign and after it. They're NPCs that are just standing there and you walk up to them and they're on the right hand side of the screen and they're spouting off dialogue and on the left side of the screen they have faction bounties which are exactly the same as in destiny in that they just involve playing the game and you know some loose requirements thrown together doing these bounties earns you faction rep and when you level up the faction you get a little care package which has a collection of goodies in it hmm then there's the Chimera Helicarrier, which is your base of operations, or as I like to call it, the Tower 2.0. It's populated with NPCs who don't do a whole lot. There's a Tess Eververse cosmetic store there where you can buy overpriced digital goods. There's a row of kiosks which serves as a bank for excess items. There's a collection of gear vendors who will let you dump your excess credits on gear that refreshes daily. So I guess that's one improvement over Destiny since vendor refreshes haven't exactly been Bungie's strongest suit. But it doesn't stop there, mind you. When you finish this game's campaign, your chosen hero will probably be around level 25 to 30, and then you need to grind out the remaining character levels until you hit level 50. While you're doing this, you're also trying to boost your light level, I mean, sorry, power level, which is a separate metric to your level, and it has some amorphous, incalculable link to damage dealt and damage taken. The missions you do are scattered throughout the star, sorry, war table, and uh, you mouse over them and you'll see that they have mission modifiers like black, I mean, whatever they call it here, where melee damage does bonus damage and your health regen takes longer, or, you know, basically all of the modifiers that Destiny has, they've just given them different names and then whacked them on here. You can adjust the difficulty of the missions by increasing its power level. Doing so rewards you with better rewards, but it's not worth it because it's just faster and more efficient to play on lower difficulties. Enemies also don't fight any differently or evolve their tactics. They're just more of them and more bigger enemies and everything hits harder and everything has more HP. But it doesn't stop there. When you finish the core campaign, you're shuttled into the end game quests, which are laid out in the same way they are in Destiny's objectives menu. And they're a chain of quests that basically ask you to do regular multiplayer missions, but they sprinkle little bits of dialogue over the top to create a sense of context. There's one of these quest lines for each of the heroes, as well as some broader quest lines 
episodes focused on high-end challenges like Elite Hives, which are sort of like multi-story procedurally generated missions that chain together random objective types one after the other. Even the currencies are copied from Destiny, where certain materials are required to upgrade your gear and upgrading the better gear requires masterwork, I mean, sorry, upgrade modules, which are a far rarer resource only obtainable from more challenging activities. Uh, you're wearing trinkets that specifically increase the reputation you earn with a chosen faction. As I said, this shit is shameless. But that does not mean that it's bad. We're all past the point now where we're arguing about whether or not Destiny sucks. We all know it's good. It's just about whether or not you happen to enjoy it. It's a formula, a cadence, a rhythm that a lot of people want to dance to. But Marvel's Avengers goes like full Drake, copying it word for word, bar for bar. I'm of a view that Marvel's Avengers has copied Bungie's homework so effectively that it's going to hold an appeal to those who enjoy that sort of thing. You're either wired to respond to the Skinner Box stimuli or you're not. I am, so as much as I was laughing at the brazenness of its copy-paste job, I was also just happily going through the motions, knocking over dull quest after dull quest, slowly increasing my power level mission by mission. It's important to recognize though, just how little endgame content is currently available. There are essentially three or four mission locations that you'll be visiting over and over again. Within them are three or four different internal tile sets that repeat ad nauseum. There's three or four mission objectives, which can be repeated three or four times within the same mission. In a genre that is famous for repetitiveness, Marvel's Avengers found a way to raise the bar, feeling somehow more repetitive than anything that has come before it. Well, you might ask, if this is so repetitive, is there anything redeeming in all of this? Is there anything worth logging in for and coming back to? In a game like this, the typical answer to that question would be loot. The pursuit of more powerful items is often so compelling that, you know, it motivates players to push through even the most boring content. That's not the case here because the loot in this game is utterly terrible, but we'll talk about that later. Instead, there's a lot of satisfaction and enjoyment to be had in simply leveling up these characters. There's six heroes here, all of whom max out at level 50, and it takes about 20 hours to get each character to that level. Combined with the campaign and general messing about, you're probably talking at least about 130 hours of gameplay in the launch state of this product, with every one of those hours supported by the meaningful and satisfying progression curve that is unlocking the full potential of each character. And believe me, these characters have a lot of potential. There's a lot of commentary out there that Marvel's Avengers is button mashy. This is straight up wrong. It's not even a matter of opinion. The combat design here for characters like Cap and Black Widow and Iron Man is so strong that skilled players can do extraordinary things and even intermediate players like myself can pull off some stuff that leaves me feeling pretty chuffed with myself. Still, I understand why so many people feel the way they do about Marvel's Avengers, about it being kind of button mashy. It's because most people will never stick around long enough to see the combat truly shine. Most other spectacle fighters or looters will give you your full character kit relatively quickly so you can start using it throughout the game. Marvel's Avengers isn't like that. It locks the character kits behind a vast leveling gate. You can't play Cap properly until he's like level 35 or 40, which is about 10 or so hours after the campaign has ended. It's at that point you'll have unlocked enough of your talents that you can really start making things happen on the battlefield. Before then, you're playing this really watered down version of Cap that doesn't do him any justice. This was a real misstep by the developers. It's another example of how much the live service nature of this game hurts it. The developers needed an incentive to push people into the late game, they needed a treadmill for people to run on, especially given how little end game content there is and how bad the loot system currently is. Locking complete character kits behind the grind probably did the job of converting 20% of players to the end game, but the remaining 80% of people will probably walk away from this game with entirely the wrong idea about just how solid each character kit is. I'm specifically focusing on character kits here rather than combat itself because I think that the character kits are often exceptional whereas combat as a whole is generally ass. It's as though the people who designed the characters never had a conversation with the people designing the enemies. Or maybe they did. Maybe they were beefing with each other. Maybe the enemy designer was like, fuck that character combat designer person. I'll fix his wagon good. And then he proceeded to specifically design enemies and encounters and objectives and mission modifiers that would completely cock block just how fun it is to fight with these characters. Enemy design is the biggest problem. The small fodder type enemies are really fun and they can be interrupted and stun locked and air juggled and 
it's definitely fun to fight them. You can make things happen. It's when you start getting to the larger enemies that we run into problems. These enemies are firmly grounded, which means you can't knock them out and you also can't interrupt their attack animations. They feel like mighty slabs of concrete whose legs reach deep into the earth. When you fight them, you can't make things happen. You just punch them and dodge and parry their attacks until one of you is dead. Many of these heavy enemies have shields that have to be broken. There's typically a few tools in your toolkit to do this, but generally there's some wind up associated with these skills, like you have to be sprinting or you have to hold down a button for a few seconds. The problem is that the enemy attack animations are faster than your wind up. So often you'll be holding down a button to break an enemy shield. And at the very last second, that enemy will just throw out some cheap jab, which interrupts your attack. And then they go straight back to blocking. It's not fun. There are big problems with the fundamental design of some enemy types. These large robots, for example, have huge amounts of HP and you have to beat on them forever. But their primary attack is a flame vent that triggers every two or three seconds whenever you're fighting them. So the actual way to fight this robot is to run up to it, hit it two or three times, step backwards, rotate 90 degrees, step forward, attack, step back, rinse, repeat, repeat, repeat. How is this supposed to be fun? But this is nothing compared to the multiplayer bosses. Check this out. This is no exaggeration how you fight endgame bosses in Marvel's Avengers. You just pile onto them and smash buttons. Any finesse or technique that exists within each character kit is smothered under the body weight of three other heroes all piling onto the same immovable sack of hit points. The first time I saw this, I couldn't stop laughing. Abomination is even better because he has this like green toxic gamma cloud around him, so you can't even stand on him. You need to stand at range and hurl your crappy projectiles at him the whole time. It's a complete farce. Then there's the staggers and the stun locks. For whatever reason, the developers decided it would be really cool if you could just constantly lose control of your character. Pretty much anything that hits you in this game will stagger you momentarily, interrupting whatever you were doing. If you were flying when this happens, then you just crash down to the ground and it takes you like one or two seconds to fall and then one or two seconds to recover. Even if you're on the ground, the sheer number of attacks that will stagger you is ridiculous and will often get to the point where your character is stun locked because there's no internal cooldown on your stagger. You can go from full health to zero by taking consecutive damage from staggering attacks because there is literally no window for you to respond to that. There is nothing you can do in those moments other than to die. This problem is further compounded by the way the game treats ranged enemies, turrets and projectiles. Ideally, ranged enemies should provide some depth to the battlefield, forcing you to reposition and either blocking line of sight or engaging those targets directly. It's meant to create a more dynamic experience. The way it's been implemented here produces the exact opposite effect. The game spams so many ranged enemies and turrets so often, and they're so disruptive due to their damage and stagger potential that the first thing you need to do at the start of every encounter is like run around and take out the turrets and then the ranged enemies and like then you can start beating on everything else. Rather than making combat feel dynamic, ranged enemies are so oppressive that they make combat feel more repetitive because you essentially need to go through the administrative checklist, like ticking them off before you can get down to the fun stuff. And don't even get me started on like the teleporting ranged enemies who can teleport anytime they like even if you're like mid combo beating the shit out of them, even if you spent like five seconds running up to them because they're annoying and then they just peace out and they just run like the other side of the map and then you just have to chase all over them like some kind of ridiculous Roadrunner cartoon. Okay, so pause. I know I'm really going here. Like there's a lot I'm complaining about, but there's so much bullshit in this. I just want to get it all out and that's it, okay? Just spare with me, okay? Your problems with ranged enemies become even worse when we add mission modifiers into the mix. Specifically, there is one modifier that greatly increases the damage dealt by projectiles. There are numerous enemy types who fire slow moving projectiles, which if this modifier is active, can and will regularly one shot you. The design logic behind these one shot projectiles and most damage in general really, is that you should be able to avoid the damage either through dodges or blocks or parries. It makes sense until you realize how bad this game is at warning you about incoming damage. There are some on-screen indicators warning you, but more often than not, some enemy projectile will just sail in completely unheralded. The absence of a reliable warning UI is one problem, but the camera is the main issue. 
This camera is probably the worst camera I fought against in an action game this generation. It felt like a PS1 era camera where the developers were just figuring out how to handle 3D. It's just so tight in, and even if you max out the camera range in the menu, it's still not enough. You can't see what's going on around you, and heaven forbid you should get anywhere near a wall or some other piece of geometry because you're basically playing in first person view at that point. Oh, and one projectile I forgot to mention was the fucking projectile that drains all of your super energy. Yes, the developers have put in more than one enemy type that will drain all of your heroic ability charge. These things take a long time to charge up by the way and they're really important to help you push through the massive waves of enemies that this game likes to throw at you or the really high HP enemies that spawn in from time to time. Not having them available to you not only makes this game much harder, it also makes it way less fun since these abilities are some of the most satisfying to use. Crystal Dynamics, please delete these enemies from the game. No one wants them, they are terrible. So, to sum all of this up, there are some very fundamental problems with the way that certain enemies are designed, the boss encounters are foobar, there are too many ranged enemies and projectiles, there are too many things that can stagger you, there's too many things that can one-shot you, there's not enough information about incoming threats, the camera is often horrific and your heroic energy is constantly being sapped. These problems and others all combine to suffocate the potential that these character kits have. Even now, I long to log on and play Cap. He feels great when the circumstances allow for it, and I honestly couldn't ask for a more satisfying rendition of what it would be like to play as a superhero that I've admired since my childhood. But the moments when that all clicks into place and it's unobscured by all that bullshit, they're just so rare, especially when you're playing solo. Last year, I reviewed the ill-fated Wolfenstein Youngblood, the open-world co-op spin-off that absolutely no one asked for. Among its many problems was the fact that this game was designed for co-op, but advertised as being playable solo. That just wasn't true. Trying to play the game solo was an exercise in futility and frustration because so much of it, like boss encounters, enemy weak spots, checkpoint systems and more, had been designed exclusively for co-op play. Play the game solo and it would essentially break. I'm at the point now with Marvel's Avengers where I basically can't play this game because matchmaking is broken and it has been since release and trying to play this content solo makes it extremely clear that none of it was designed for solo play in mind despite how much Crystal Dynamics say otherwise. To be clear, solo play is an option here. You can disable matchmaking when you queue into a mission and when you do so, you'll pull three of your AI companions into the mission and they'll run around doing stuff. Cleverly, they can actually be equipped with the gear and cosmetics that you've assigned to those heroes, which meant I actually felt a deeper connection to them when they accompanied me on a mission. During missions, your AI teammates are actually pretty useful in a fight. They target the bad guys, they'll combo them, they'll do big damage and they will drop targets. This isn't a case of them just looking like they're fighting so that you can sail in and deliver the killing blows. They do pull their own weight, at least when it comes to combat. When it comes to objectives, it's a very different story. Your AI teammates are completely brain dead. They have no concept whatsoever of objectives, and that's a very big problem when it comes to a game like this, which is very objectives focused. Most of the missions involve doing a thing, like standing on a point, or capturing a number of points, or destroying some circuit board thing, and when you're solo, you're the only one on the map playing the objective. It makes everything feel like such a chore, because it is. And then there's the way that developers seem to purposefully make it harder when you're solo. Like this vault, for example. You need to stand on this point to advance the objective. If you're not on the point, but one of your AI teammates are, that doesn't count. It won't progress the objective for some reason. So you need to stand there the entire time while snipers are shooting at you from across the room because you're the one person on the team that can advance the objective. Then there's resurrection. If I die in multiplayer, I can be resurrected an infinite number of times by my teammates. If I'm playing solo, I can only be downed three times before I go back to checkpoint. In the case of this vault mission, I can die at the very last wave of enemies after like 15 or 20 minutes of fighting, only to then have to do the entire thing all over again because I got one shot by some invisible projectile that I had no way of avoiding because I never even knew it was coming. More fundamentally, combat is just so stupid when you're playing solo because too many enemies are focused on you. Enemy AI seems to be programmed to prioritize you as the target 90% of the time. So in the same example, in this vault, dozens of enemies spawn and they practically ignore my AI teammates. They all make a beeline directly for me. So I've got snipers in the back shooting me. I've got drones in the sky shooting at me. I've got every ground unit running at me. 
It's the same number of enemies that would spawn in normal co-op, except everyone is focused on me. Now I know this is a co-op game, I get that, but the fact is, it's marketed as a game that can be played solo, and I'm here to tell you that no, it cannot. Given that matchmaking is currently broken, I'm at a point where I basically can't play the game now because the design of endgame missions is so hostile to solo play that it's just too frustrating to push through. I mean, I could if I really, really grit my teeth and put up with all this bullshit, but I don't want to, especially when the biggest carrot to motivate me, the hunt for endgame loot, is so unsatisfying. So let's have a brief chat about loot in games. What is the point of loot in games like these? Well, I think it has a few important functions. Firstly, it makes your character more powerful, giving you the raw stats you need to deal more damage, take more damage, and generally stare down more challenging threats. Secondly, loot is a means of visually customizing your character. These looters always go to great lengths to make loot that is visually appealing, since the design of your character, making them look good, is a really powerful motivator. Loot games offer the best possible showcase of just how central cosmetic appearance is to a game's appeal. Thirdly, loot is a means of varying our core gameplay loop. You may run with a sword one day or an axe the next, a scout rifle on a Monday and a pulse rifle on a Friday. The decision to use different items really changes up the fundamentals of how we play our characters. Finally, these sorts of games always use loot as a means of finessing a final build for your character. So you may be using a sword instead of an axe, but you're focusing on attack speed over crit, or you're putting a lot of stats into ability power to make your special attacks hit harder. These are more subtle changes to your playstyle, but when you add all of these subtle changes up, they often combine to create vastly different gameplay opportunities for you as you're controlling your character. Pretty much any looter you can think of will offer a loot system that pulls on most of these levers at the same time. So Diablo is one example where all of these levers are available and there's a lot of range in each of them. You have stats, there are different weapon types, there's cosmetic gear, you can build each character vastly differently depending on how you want them to look and play. Even something like like Anthem pulled most of these levers. You could use different weapons. There were stats that made you more powerful, stats that let you define a specific playstyle. The biggest gap was the look of your character was separate from your loot since they wanted to sell you skins in their cosmetic shop. Thankfully, no game, until now, has been stupid enough to repeat that mistake. Marvel's Avengers has the worst loot system of any loot game I've ever played because it pulls on the levers that it shouldn't and it ignores the ones that it should. There is a power level system here that is pegged to general eye level. You get stats as you play, making it possible to take on higher level foes. This is of course the least satisfying component of any gear game. It's completely analogous to player level, and it only serves to prolong the march to maximum player power for the sake of it. The player doesn't feel manifestly more powerful as they move through this curve because they continue to take on commensurately higher level enemies. It's the classic hamster wheel, a lot of running to get nowhere at all. Secondly, none of the gear you pick up in this game has caused cosmetic properties whatsoever. It's a repeat of one of the biggest mistakes that Anthem made for precisely the same reason that Anthem made it, because they wanted to monetize the appearance of your character. We'll come back to this point when we talk more about monetization, but suffice it to say, loot is incredibly unsatisfying to collect and equip if it's basically just an invisible stat sheet. Thirdly, there are no items I can equip, such as new weapons or armor that fundamentally change the way I play. In some instances, this makes sense. I mean, it's not like I can start using a trident when I'm playing playing as Thor. Thor literally stops being Thor when he doesn't have Molnir, so you can't mess with that. But Caps had a few different iterations of his shield over the years. Black Widow could use a different set of pistols if she chose. Iron Man is able to equip an unlimited arsenal of weaponry. There was no weaponry loot slot implemented into this game, and it feels like that's a big missed opportunity for really meaningful build diversity options. What you can do though, is you can build your character to do more melee damage or more range damage or have more health or be more efficient in the use of their hero powers. This is so silly for so many reasons. No one is going to build a ranged Hulk. I mean, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Similarly, are you really gonna build a tank Black Widow piling on extra defensive stats for her so she can take damage in a game that is entirely built around dodging and parrying damage rather than taking it? When Hawkeye arrives later on, why would I build melee for him? He's an archer, he shoots arrows. Why is there a gear system that is going to flood Hawkeye with melee and defensive stacked items when the thing he should be chasing is ranged damage? This is what's so counterintuitive about this system. The Avengers already have roles. 
Kamala punches things, Hawkeye shoots things, Hulk smash. Yes, some characters have some sort of hybrid approach where they mix up ranged and melee attacks, but even then I'd argue that asking me to choose between a ranged cap or a melee cap or a tank cap, they're all just really dumb options. I don't know why we have this sort of roles based stat system in a game where roles are already pretty much defined. I don't want to have to choose between melee and ranged. I'd like to select stats that benefit both of those. I don't want to have to stack defensive stats in a game that is primarily about avoiding damage in all instances. It makes it feel like I'm gearing to reduce the impacts of my own failure, which is never a fun gearing choice in an RPG. Finally, there are the modifier stats which exist on the gear. It's basically passive buffs like a 15.4% chance to get health regen when you do a light combo finisher or your attacks have a 12.2% chance to apply pim particle damage when you do a heavy combo finisher. Like enemy design, the gear clashes with the flexibility inherent in your character's combat kit. Most of it will ask you to use one combo finisher over another or ranged attacks, which really isn't fun since you want to do whatever combo finisher or attack you damn well please. It's frustrating to be told to use a specific attack over another because it's more efficient to do so. The final nail in the coffin is just how goofy this is. I mean, I made the joke about farming Hulk spines in my beta impressions. It doesn't feel any better in the final game. It's so dumb, so counterintuitive, so ham-fisted, so shoehorned in. I've never seen a loot system that feels more out of place than this one. It simply does not belong in this game at all. For me, the two biggest explanations for why loot is so weak is number one, they wanted to charge you for skin, so they had to take away the cosmetic properties. Number two, a lot of the power that's typically put onto gear has actually been moved into the talent trees. If you go and have a look at those, there's a lot of ability and stat modifying stuff that really does augment your playstyle in very meaningful ways, but it's on the skill tree, it's not on the gear. And so the gear has really no room to do interesting things because most of that heavy lifting is already being done by your skill trees. If Crystal Dynamics had considerably trimmed these skill trees, it would have enabled people to experience the full character kit sooner and they could have pushed these stat and ability modifying skills onto gear and that would have created a more interesting gear game both early on and into the end game. There's going to be a lot of stuff that changes about this game over the coming years and top of that list is the loot system. I guarantee you the loot system here will be completely unrecognizable in a year or in 18 months time. There's almost nothing worth keeping. It needs to be ripped out and replaced because what's there right now really only serves as some cautionary tale to other looter games about how to get everything wrong all at once. And speaking of getting everything wrong all at once, let's talk about bugs and optimization. I originally played Marvel's Avengers on the PS4 Pro during the beta where the performance could really only be described as horrifying. Frame drops out the ass that were sort of obscured or they tried to cover them up by using the most crazy motion blur I'd ever seen before. I reviewed the final build of the game on my PC. It's a 2080 Ti with an i7 8700K. So I can't comment on the final console performance, but I've heard that it has improved from the beta, but that frame drops are still a regular occurrence. On my PC, it's unbelievable how bad this thing runs. Unbelievable. I was so often getting frame drops down to 10 FPS, just constant, constant frame drops whenever the action hits. Much of this is triggered by the destructible environments, which are a really nice feature to be sure, but it's clear that they should not have been implemented given how severe the performance hit is. In my last third of the campaign, the stuttering began and it didn't stop for a long time. I spent at least five, maybe 10 hours playing like this. Even now, I still get the occasional stutter, but it's hard to tell if this is because of some massive FPS drop or something actually seizing up. It's particularly frustrating to experience all of this because under very specific conditions, the game runs at a very solid 80 FPS plus. When this happens, it feels like you're playing a different game. It's this brief glimpse into what could have been if the game had spent more time in development and properly optimized the game before shoving it out the door. There's a dynamic resolution scaling option which you can enable to maintain a more consistent frame rate. I tried this and it did not maintain a more consistent frame rate at all. 
while only achieving to make the game look like shit. So I turned it off and nothing of value was lost. The game crashes extremely regularly. I've had at least 10 crashes during my 50 hours with it. One of the reasons I can't really play this game at this point is because the later elite and heroic missions are really long by design. I just don't have the confidence that the game won't crash at a moment's notice, like completely invalidating all of my progress since there's no checkpoint system when you get disconnected. This has happened to me twice and I refuse to let it happen again. Somewhat related to this is the fact that enemies often fall through the world. When this happens, you have to reload the last checkpoint even though you've probably spent 10 minutes clearing the room. This has happened to me at least three times now. There are regular audio glitches. Specifically, the snow stage just doesn't have any sound. Or like, it's weirdly broken. It's completely broken. There are animation glitches too. This one with Cap is my personal favorite. It has to stop. It's time we replace their poisonous lies with the truth. And then there's also this, which isn't really anything, it's just funny nitpicking. There are many, many issues relating to progression, loot, and cosmetics. Numerous quests do not update when you progress them. Exotics are bugged and aren't dropping. Your challenge card objectives don't update properly. Cosmetics are being deleted from people's accounts after they've been acquired. In-game currencies mysteriously disappear. The paid credits from the cash shop are also being deleted. So if you spend your money with Square Enix, be prepared for it just to vanish into the ether. But by far the most disruptive and most unacceptable bug is that as of today, the 11th of September, when I recorded this audio, matchmaking still does not work. It's been over a month since the first beta. It's been nine days since this game was released to Deluxe Edition customers, and matchmaking still does not work. They released a patch and still matchmaking does not work and they don't even have an ETA on when matchmaking will be fixed. Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics did not provide early review code for this game because they said the co-op was so integral to the experience that they couldn't possibly let reviewers play it without access to co-op play. They held back review code for this reason, but they didn't hold back the launch of the game for this reason. They didn't delay it by a week until matchmaking was working. They just said, fuck it, ship it, off it goes, absolute rubbish. As I've said on Twitter, Marvel's Avengers is actually the most buggy AAA game I have played at launch. Anthem was nowhere near as buggy as this, so let's just remove that from the conversation. Fallout 76 was as buggy as this, but you could at least play that game. You could laugh at its glitches while you played the game. Here, I can't play this game at the moment. The solo experience is so poorly designed and I don't have any friends to play with and I can't matchmake. And if I do, I'll probably just get one shot by some invisible projectile in the last stage of a vault or my game will crash or some enemy will fall through the floor or some colossal frame drop will see me get staggered and stun locked until I die. I've tried, I've really tried to continue playing this game, but I just can't. And to anyone during the beta that was like, oh, it's just a beta, bro. They're going to fix it. Chill. I'll see you in the next major AAA release that launches with a shoddy beta because you guys just never learn. On the exact same day that Marvel's Avengers was released, Amazon released season two of The Boys. Now, if you're not familiar with The Boys, close this video right now and go and watch it. Like The Watchmen, it's a deconstruction of the superhero. Only the heroes aren't crippled by psychological trauma as much as they're just assholes. And they work for a big conglomerate that turns superheroes into a multi-billion dollar business. Which is of course exactly what they are in real life, so it's quite a clever inversion on the idea. The opening of Marvel's Avengers was interesting to me because it felt like something that belonged in The Boys more than it belonged in the MCU. It's a version of the Avengers where they throw some big carnival, they erect statues of themselves, they sell merchandise and make video games based on their likenesses. In Marvel's Avengers, the Avengers are not just a team, they're a product. I was very clear in my beta impressions that I held concerns about the way this game was being monetized. The Verizon Up skins, the Virgin Mobile skins, the Five Gum skins, the Cash Shop, the pre-order only beta, the deluxe editions, the paid battle passes per character. Sadly, I was pretty much spot on with everything I said and Marvel's Avengers stands out as one of the most monetized AAA games ever released. One thing I wasn't ready for was Intel specific graphic settings. Intel and Square Enix partnered up and if you have an Intel CPU, you can enable specific graphic settings that aren't available if you're using AMD. 
That's a new thing. I hope that doesn't stick around. The cash shop is really gross. Its prices are ludicrous. You've just paid $60 or more for this game and immediately it's putting out its hand trying to charge you 15 US dollars for a skin. The takedowns for each character are like 10 bucks a pop. You've already paid for this game and like the stuff is already there. It's on the disc so to speak and Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics, they want you to give them even more money on day one to access it. It's not even good either. Like look at this ghetto crappy skin. This is like 10 bucks. Is this really what you're asking for? Is, really? You want me to give you $10 for this? These are mobile prices. I literally downloaded a free-to-play Marvel MOBA the same week that I started playing Marvel's Avengers. It's called like Marvel Super War or something. I don't know, it's dumb, but whatever, it's fun. The prices in that game are the same as the prices in this game, and that game is fucking free. I just want to address this whole, like, it's cosmetic defense, by the way, as well, since a lot of people argue that all of this is justified because the appearance of your character, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's not gameplay affecting, whatever else. There are moments, so many moments, in fact, in this campaign where your appearance, the suit that your hero is wearing, is integral to the story that is being told. When I'm playing as Iron Man here, this mission is about me putting together a better suit because the one I'm wearing is old and outdated and crap. When you play through the mission, Jarvis is constantly referencing the fact that, hey man, your suit's really old, it's gonna give out. Oh no, I hope you can make it to the end of the mission because your suit is a real worry. The suit's doing great. Isn't calling it a suit rather generous? The thing is, I just went into the menu and I changed suits and then I looked cool and I was like in this new suit and then the mission just felt goofy, it didn't make any sense. See how your character appearance affects the very core of a game? Superhero appearances, their suits, have always told the story about where that character has come from, or where they're now, or where they're going. Of course they matter to a game about superheroes. So locking the best of these suits, these outfits, these cosmetics behind a paywall is a really shitty way to monetize your game, especially at these prices and especially given that the loot game is so bad that collecting skins probably would have been the only thing worth doing. Then there's the paid battle passes. They are $10 for each newly added character and if you grind through the whole battle pass, you get the credits back, making the battle pass essentially free. The catch of course is that your progress is gated daily and weekly. You cannot advance your battle pass at the rate that you choose to advance it. You have to do it on Square Enix's timetable and that sucks. The grind to earn anything for free in this game is of course ridiculous. I'm over 50 hours deep now and I still can't afford one legendary skin. The defense that most of these cosmetics are free if you grind them is just the same bullshit it's always been. Look, here's the thing. I am not against monetizing games. I genuinely am not. To explain all of the intricacies of this, it would take like fucking 10 videos, okay? But just know I'm not against fair prices for fair products in games. I believe that if you wanna make a live service in particular, that you need to create some sort of long tail monetization options to fund continued development. But if you're gonna do that, find a way that isn't shit. If you're gonna cram your game full of corporate sponsorships, then use that money to fund development. If you're gonna have a skin shop, don't sell stuff that's already been made, shipped on day one, at exuberant mobile game prices. If you're gonna give people paid battle passes, don't throttle their progress. If you're gonna give them a chance to grind for things, don't tune that grind to be unreachable to all but the most no-lifer of players. The problem with the monetization in Marvel's Avengers is that it isn't one thing. It's all the things and all the dials are turned hard to the right. With this much monetization crammed into every part of it, this game should have been free to play. Instead, it's a premium price game that just feels so greedy and gross. Hello, thanks for making it this far. It's been a long review and I appreciate you sticking around. We've covered a lot. We talked about the fact that this game has a pretty decent story and a worthwhile campaign, except when the multiplayer missions spoil the fun. We've talked about the Destiny-like endgame and how vacant it is at the moment. We've talked about how the excellent character kits are undermined by some really awful enemy and combat design. We've talked about how hard it is to play this game solo. We've talked about the loot game and the bugs and the monetization and how none of these are good or acceptable. To be extremely clear, this game is a complete mess right now and there's no way it should have been released in this state. No way. Coming back to what I said at the start of this review, it's a reminder of just how little the video games industry has learned about how to successfully launch a live service game like this. But the reality is, the launch of a live service game is just step one in a long journey to either greatness or obscurity. 
Destiny 1 and Destiny 2 both had famously bad launches, but both went on to become extraordinary titles. Conversely, Anthem's launch was an unmitigated disaster, and right now, it's still only early in its prototyping for its long-promised Anthem Next resurrection. My point is, it can go either way, but if I was a betting man, I'd put large money on Marvel's Avengers surviving and thriving in the years to come. And there's two main reasons that I have this optimism. Number one, I really do believe that character combat design is first class. I really do believe that Crystal Dynamics have shown that they know how to build characters that play beautifully and have a full kit that's both functional and flexible. The kind of flexibility that lets advanced players truly express themselves during combat. When all of the bugs in this game are fixed and all the bullshit that ruins combat is pruned back, and more endgame content is added, I think the core combat will shine through and it will win people over and it will keep people coming back. The other reason I have this optimism is just because this is the Avengers we're talking about here. And that means something. I remember when I got control of Cap for the first time and I was on the Chimera and I was just walking around deciding what I would do next. And it hit me like, hey, this is my Cap. I could dress him how I liked. I could gear him how I liked. I could train with him or I could go out on a mission. When matchmaking eventually works, I'd be fighting alongside other people who chose a different character because that's who they wanted to be. But I'm Cap, that's who I choose to bring to the team. He's the hero that means the most to me and this game lets me be him. Sure, there's Marvel Ultimate Alliance and Marvel vs Capcom and Lego Avengers, but there's no game quite like this that lets me basically roleplay as Captain America and build that sort of connection with him. That counts for something, I think, and when all is done and dusted, I think that unique connection is going to be the biggest driver that keeps this game alive. Crystal Dynamics have literally years of work ahead of them to realize the full potential of this game that they've just released, but I think they will get there, and when they do, I think it'll be worth it. For now though, steer clear. With the exception of the campaign, this thing is a mess, it is not finished, and it is not worth your time. This video was brought to you by Opera GX, the first browser to be made specifically for gamers. Now I know what you're thinking, that sounds dumb. Why would gamers need a specific browser? That's a good question. Don't think of Opera GX as something that will like improve your KD and make you MLG Pro, no. This is just a browser that has a whole bunch of features built in that gamers would find useful. For example, the GX control tool lets you set RAM and CPU usage limits for your browser. Now, if you're running a high-end machine, this probably isn't gonna help you, but if you've got a mid-range or low-end machine, then this is handy because other browsers can use a surprising amount of horsepower, especially when you have multiple tabs open. Setting limits means you can know your browser is never hogging resources better used elsewhere. There's also a hot tabs killer that shows you which specific tabs are using the most CPU and RAM so you can close them specifically. On top of that, there's a network limiter which you can use whenever you're playing online or downloading something, ensuring that the browser is chewing up as little bandwidth as possible. As you'd expect, you can also customize the look of this thing. There are different color themes available. There are standard wallpapers that you can select from, but you can also import your own. One thing I quite like is GX Corner. It's a landing page that showcases free games each week, day, month, whatever, from places like Epic, PS Plus, Games with Gold. It also shows upcoming releases and highlight some of the best deals you can get on new and old games. The integrations are a real highlight. The inbuilt Twitch integration showcases all the streamers I follow and I get a little notification whenever one of them is live so I never miss a stream. There's also full integration with Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram and most importantly Discord. It's built in right there. Opera GX also have their own server you can join where they run regular giveaways. Finally, the best feature in this entire browser is the pop out video function. Any YouTube video I am watching, I can pop it out with the press of a button, move it around anywhere I like on my screen, and it always stays on top, which means that I can overlay it on any game that I am playing. So I don't need a second monitor to watch YouTube videos. It's just right there in front of me, easy as. Opera GX is free. It's totally free. There's no strings attached. You can click the link in the description below to download it right now. And if you're on mobile, don't worry, because if you click that link, you'll get an email reminding you to download it later. I have switched over to this browser and I'm now using it as my main browser. 
Check it out and you might as well. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time.